Venom is one of Spider-Man's most iconic foes. Ever since he burst onto the pages of Spider-Man 300 in 1988, he has lived in the hearts and minds of fans ever since. Well, what if I told you that, fairly quickly after his debut, Venom almost made his jump to the big screen before any Spider-Man movie ever came out? Well, that's the movie we'll be discussing today as we break down the development, plot, and cancellation of David S. Goyer's Venom. The year was 1997, and between his memorable appearances on Spider-Man the Animated Series, video games, and his own comic book series, Venom's popularity showed no signs of slowing down. It was around this time that New Line Cinema was delivered a script for a Venom movie written by David S. Goyer. And although the casting was never official, Dolph Lundgren was heavily rumored to play Eddie Brock. At this point, the movie rights to Venom were owned by New Line, but Spider-Man's movie rights were busy being tangled and passed around between seemingly everybody but New Line. As a result, Spider-Man couldn't be involved with the movie's story at all. The very early makings of a movie were coming together, though it obviously never got off the ground. But before we get to why, let's take a deep dive into the film's plot. Our story begins on Christmas of 1975 in the St. Estes Psychiatric Hospital. A young teen named Cletus Cassidy has set fire to the building and has taken another boy named Eddie Brock hostage, eventually dragging him to the building's roof. After Eddie tries and fails to defend himself, Cassidy sadistically toys with him. This culminates in Cassidy scarring Eddie's face with a makeshift shiv before he makes a hasty escape, jumping to the roof of an adjacent building. Meanwhile, out in the far reaches of space, on a strange alien world, a black spider-like creature known as the Other is chased by a horde of similar-looking red creatures called Blood Hunters. The Other manages to steal a launch pod just in time to launch himself off the planet and away from harm. Years later, Eddie, now a scrawny, helpless adult, finds himself working for The Daily Weekly, a particularly trashy tabloid. He returns to the office and is fired by his jerk boss named Bitterman. He decides to drink his problems away at The Deep, his favorite bar, and talk about his problems with the bartender, Rochelle. Just then, a news report begins, explaining that the now infamous serial killer, Cletus Cassidy, who since earned the nickname Carnage, is getting sentenced to death tomorrow, and that his execution will be the first ever nationally televised. It goes on to highlight Eddie and his column that he used to write at his previous job called Venom, which followed Cassidy's murders and told his story. The column was popular. It made Cassidy a star of sorts and gained him a strange following of twisted hooligans. But it also made Eddie a star, and that made Cassidy very jealous. So he tried to kill him. But Eddie was under surveillance and played unwitting bait, which led to Cassidy's capture and arrest. In the bar, a rowdy patron named Dougal, who's a fan of Cassidy's, recognizes Eddie and beats the hell out of him. Eddie leaves the bar and is held up by a mugger, and just when the criminal is about to beat Eddie up, the other's launch pod crashes into him and craters into the street. The pod opens up to reveal the bare skeleton of the six-armed being. Next to it is the other, now a pool of tar-like substance that quickly envelops Eddie's entire body. Dougal and his goons trash the deep and threaten Rochelle when Eddie returns to the bar, now brimming with confidence. As Dougal approaches him, Eddie's body begins to ripple until it coalesces into something else entirely. Venom. Venom dispatches the goons, chases Dougal to a nearby church, and eventually throws him off of the bell tower. Just then, the clock strikes midnight. The bell rings and reveals one of the other's weaknesses, dissonant sound. Venom's flesh begins to writhe as it turns back into Eddie. After having a nightmare of the symbiote homeworld where he's attacked by a blood hunter using Cassidy's body as a vessel, Eddie wakes up, involuntarily turning into Venom, and starts out into the night. Eddie eventually finds his way to Bitterman's office, turning into Venom and throwing him three stories into the dumpster below. As Eddie becomes more comfortable sharing his body with the other, as Venom, they sense that another symbiote is coming. One of the blood hunters has followed the other to Earth. Eddie then realizes that his nightmare was the other's way of telling him that a blood hunter was coming and that it would specifically bond with Cassidy when it got here. A panicked Eddie calls Dr. Rachel Kafka, Cassidy's psychiatrist at the prison, and tells her to stop the execution, that people's lives are in danger. Kafka is shaken by this, but at this point, It'd take an act of God to stop this from happening. 
As Eddie rushes to the prison, the Blood Hunters pod explodes over the roof of the building, and it falls to the surface in streamers of silly string-like material. It moves through the vents, to the ceilings, to the inside of the wires of Cassidy's electric chair. He gives his final words on national TV, and the chair is activated. But Cassidy doesn't die. His headlights on fire, and the lights explode. When the smoke clears, Cassidy is gone, and everybody wonders where he went until they notice up on the ceiling, a long, lean, red monster. Carnage. He toys with Kafka, nearly choking the life out of her before Eddie shows up and unleashes Venom. But just before they fight, Carnage escapes. Kafka comes to in a hospital bed and is greeted by two men named Truman Marsh and John Teague. They work for a government agency called The Vault. They're looking for the symbiote that fused with Cassidy and figure Kafka might know something. They coerce Kafka to come with them to their secret base, where Kafka learns all about symbiotes. That the Vault has been recovering these specimens for decades, and how these creatures assume and amplify the psychological traits of their hosts. So Cassidy is even more dangerous than before. Kafka deduces that Cassidy is probably headed to find Eddie, who she lets it be known is in possession of the black symbiote that they're also looking for. They break into Eddie's apartment, and upon it being empty, Kafka puts together that Cassidy is probably targeting the former employees of St. Estes. When they manage to track down one of the hospital's orderlies, they arrive to find Carnage, who already killed him. He launches a volley of needles that manages to drop the vault's troops, until Venom shows up and they begin to fight. During the scuffle, Carnage turns his hand into a shotgun and shoots Kafka. Carnage flees, and Venom escapes with Kafka in his arms, trying to get her somewhere safe as the Vault troops shoot at them with ultrasonic rifles. Venom takes Kafka to an underground shelter where he tells her that she's dying. To save her, Eddie transfers the symbiote onto her. Meanwhile, Cassidy breaks into a TV studio and hijacks the airwaves. Mid-broadcast, he morphs into Carnage and tells his viewers that after tonight, there will be no more law and Cassidy's fanatical followers begin to chant his name in the streets. Kafka comes to completely healed and symbiote-less. The other explains to Kafka that the Blood Hunters want Earth and that it came to warn them. At this point, she teams up with Eddie to stop Cassidy. They wind up back at her apartment and try to figure out where Cassidy's going next. They eventually share a tender moment and almost kiss, before Venom emerges and she recoils back. Just then, Vault Troop show up capturing Venom using white phosphor grenades and sonic rifles to brutally attack them. Marsh appears and reveals to Kafka that they put a tracker on her from all the way back when she was asleep in the hospital. At the vault's base, Eddie is successfully separated from the other, which puts him into a coma-like state. Marsh then tells Kafka that they plan to replicate the symbiote for military purposes and offers her the future position of head psychiatrist for troops using the symbiote. Upon her turning it down, Marsh throws her into solitary confinement. The doctors monitoring Eddie notice that his vitals and the others are mirroring each other. Eddie begins to have a nightmare where he's a child on a strange fusion of the symbiote homeworld and St. Estes. He sees Kid Cassidy, who morphs into Kid Carnage and is about to attack him. Eddie thrashes in his sleep as the other thrashes in sync with him. One of the lab scientists shoot the other with microwave lasers, but it only seems to strengthen its resolve, thrashing harder and faster until it breaks out of containment and Eddie's eyes snap open. The other escapes, feeding itself through ethernet cables and makes its way over to Kafka's cell. They fuse, becoming She-Venom, who blows through a bunch of the guards and T. She races through the compound before reuniting with Eddie. Overjoyed, she makes out with him, transferring the symbiote back to him in the process. The duo make their escape, and Eddie figures that since he saw St. Estes in his dream, that must be where Cassidy is going. As they arrive to the burnt-out remains of St. Estes, Kafka reveals a syringe of vitamin C that she stole from the vault's infirmary. A full dose can paralyze brain functions. Eddie then brandishes a white phosphor grenade that he stole, figuring that if it hurt Venom, it could also hurt Carnage. Kafka then tells Eddie that when she bonded with the other, she was able to see Eddie's memories of St. Estes, and deduces that the symbiotes have a genetic memory, which means if even the smallest part of Carnage escapes, this mess isn't over. They track Cassidy, who spent the entire night laying waste to New York City as Carnage, to the roof, in the fetal position, totally crazed. The Blood Hunter is devouring him from the inside. Soon, 
there'll be nothing left of him and the symbiote will begin to spore. Cassidy sees Venom and transforms into a metastasized, bigger, badder carnage. It begins to rip chunks of the other off of Eddie's body before Venom falls to the ground. Carnage approaches Kafka, again toying with her, and just when all seems lost, she pulls out an air horn from her purse and uses it on Carnage. As Carnage's skin peels back, she stabs Cassidy with the syringe, which causes the red symbiote to unravel around him. Kafka tells Eddie to separate from the other, and after protest from the symbiote, Eddie manages to force it off of him, at which point the Blood Hunter separates from Cassidy and the two formless beings begin to fight. Eddie apologizes to the other before throwing the grenade at the dueling masses. As they go up in flames, Cassidy screams how he needs carnage and throws himself into the fire. The next morning, Marsh and Teague search St. Estes and come up with no symbiotes, but quickly realize that they recovered a needle from the last time the vault saw carnage, and might be able to make up a whole new symbiote. That night, Eddie and Kafka stand by the river and talk about how, because of the other, they're now bonded forever, before eventually sharing a kiss. They look at the stars, Kafka resting her head on Eddie's chest. His smile widens to an impossible length. Then his skin changes, then his eyes, and then his tongue. Kafka takes in the night and asks, We're going to be happy, aren't we, Eddie? And Venom says, Yes, we are. I am genuinely shocked that some specific parts of this script so closely mirror that first Venom movie that we got. The appearance of She-Venom and transferring the symbiote through kissing, Venom inexplicably being alive at the end, and the lack of any real Spider-Man connections. While there are some choices that I don't really follow, like Eddie being characterized as a wiry wimp even though they supposedly wanted Dolph Lundgren who definitely isn't those things, I really enjoyed the script. Its tone strikes the perfect amount of goofy and it has interesting takes on comic concepts like the symbiote planet and you believe why the other would bond with Eddie and why the blood hunter would bond with Cassidy. Overall, this script is a wacky good time. It definitely had potential, so that raises the question. Why did it get canned? Admittedly, there's little information as to why the film never saw the light of day. But what we do know is that any movement on Venom seemingly stalled out after this draft of the script was submitted. In 1999, Spider-Man's film rights would get worked out, finally finding a home at Sony and Columbia Pictures. And since New Line wasn't actively developing Venom, the rights for the character eventually reverted back to Sony. In the end, I have mixed feelings about this version of Venom never getting off the ground. The ideas that they had were very solid, and with another pass or two on the script, I feel like it could have been, at the very least, as good as that first Venom movie we got. But by that same token, I personally love that first Venom movie. And in the same way that this script is, I think that it's also the perfect level of cheese and goof and an overall blast of a movie. And I don't think that that movie would get made if this one did. I think that it's ultimately for the best that this draft of Venom never saw the light of day. But that's the story of Venom and the end of yet another episode of Canned Goods. So until next time, thank you so much for watching, be good to each other, and stay hemmers.